Hey, Chelsea. Hi, Keith. <laughs> Okay, well, let's go ahead and uh, get going again. Uh, one thing that we could always be pretty confident of when we were meeting in the regular classroom was that the, uh, the second hour of the day would find fewer people on, on board than the, than the first hour. It was awful hard when the weather was good, especially uh, coming in off the oval or after lunch or whatever. But it looks like you, you folks have made a fine return and I appreciate you coming back for the second hour um, of the day. Um, Katie, I don't know what the deal is with record. Uh, I'm gonna hit record again here. And uh, in the email, just before we started here, there was an email telling me that we did have a, a recording from that first session. So I, I, I don't know, we'll see if we got a recording on this next one, I guess. Uh, certainly is a good idea to have recordings. All right. Uh, anybody have any questions, comments before we get going? Let me slip some glasses on here and see what I'm doing and while we're thinking about questions a little bit, let me uh, read just the uh, concluding couple of paragraphs from this uh, chemical and engineering news article on the, on the virus. And uh, give us something to ponder overnight as we think about this complicated situation we live in now with the with the virus so here here they go um three previously unknown coronaviruses have jumped from wild animals into humans in the past two decades all with deadly consequences that's prompted some scientists to start thinking ahead to the seemingly inevitable emergence of yet another new coronavirus ted ross director of the center for vaccines and immunology at the university of georgia is working on developing a vaccine that is an amalgamation of the most Im 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 immunogenic parts of several coronavirus spike proteins, including coronaviruses that have yet to infect humans. It contains the best of everything in the wild, he says. He hopes to test the universal coronavirus vaccine in the clinic sometime in 2021. According to him, quote, this virus is not going away. People still need to follow universal precautions like social distancing and wearing masks. We have to be careful, he says. We hope we will have a vaccine that works and it is likely to happen, but we probably shouldn't put everything in that basket. Therapeutics, antiviral drugs, and public health still need to be high on our priority list. We can't wait for vaccines to come save us all. Uh, so kind of an interesting uh, perspective, I thought. 
on the whole situation. Yeah, wow. If, uh, <laughs> yeah, let's hope that another virus doesn't follow this one. That'll be a real, real tough deal. Anybody have any thoughts or comments uh, on that? So hopefully um, I've been able to share my screen uh, with, with people. Um, there's a PowerPoint in Moodle uh, called an introduction to pharmacology. And it's one of a few versions of this that I've put together, which are just a, um, a collection of various things that probably seem a little bit scattered to you. And, and that's probably right. Uh, probably is a little bit scattered, but uh, try to um, make some inroads um, into the um, idea that there are certain um, common themes in pharmacology, whether we're talking about antipsychotic drugs or hormonal drugs. Uh, there are certain basic principles in the pharmacology and toxicology of those substances that are worth our consideration, uh, regardless of what specific group of drugs we're talking about that per, at that particular time. So there's some of that in here. There's pictures of cats and dogs and things like that and some other topics, some of which we may uh, skip by uh, for now and others which we'll talk about um, a, a little bit more. Um, if, if uh, questions arise uh, dur during these uh, uh, discussions li like this, please um, speak up. Um, we're not in today in any sort of terrible time rush. If we don't get all the way through this PowerPoint today, we've, we've certainly got tomorrow's lecture at one o'clock to fall back on to, to do completion. So here's uh, st some, some thoughts sort of random thoughts uh, about the sciences of pharmacology and toxicology. And I, and I talk about those as sciences, uh, but, but really it, it, it's one science. Pharmacology and toxicology is, is really a, um, a various um, sub-themes which are associated with each other, which are common to both those um, areas. So I'll probably sometimes refer to it in the singular and sometimes in the, in the plural. Well, th this just goes to, uh, to what we were talking about earlier. Uh, please um, use the resources available and, and, and ask us questions or ask yourselves questions for that matter. It's, it's really neat in sharing like, like this. Um, it doesn't have to be just the instructors. It can be, um, you know, the students uh, chipping in with uh, uh, responses, answers to various questions, and so on. In fact, uh, th that would be wonderful if the class would um, be able to participate in that particular manner. But I like putting old Mr. Ed up here in the beginning just to emphasize the idea that, um, you know, pl please ask questions if, if you so desire. Uh, I, I have found over the years that if one student has a question, very likely other students have the same question. So it's, it's quite uh, likely that um, you're helping somebody else out too if you, uh, if you ask a question for clarity or uh, additional information, whatever it might be. So think about Mr. Ed in that sense. Apparently in the setting that Mr. Ed was in, um, he, he was not able to freely ask questions. This is not the cat that was um, sitting by me, but he's uh, one of our um, cats. He's, he's an elder citizen these days and uh, is um, aging quite rapidly, kind of like me. And um, 
bring him up because I, I don't know if you can notice in this in this picture or not, but um, you can see just a little little bit of his nictitating membrane, particularly in his right eye. Um, the next slide in the sequence here has to do with the nictitating membrane, and I'm not going to spend long with it right now, but I I, I, I bring it up um, because it, it at one time historically was an interesting tool in pharmacology for uh, measuring the effects of autonomic drugs. The nictitating membrane is uh, regulated by the autonomic nervous system. And uh, in, in Hipshot's case here, um, it, it's prolapsed in that it doesn't completely withdraw. And that's why you can see just a little bit of it there in the, uh, uh, in, in the photo of, of, of hip shot. Uh, bring that up because what we know about drugs, uh, both in terms of their macroscopic and microscopic aspects, uh, relies upon the tools that we have for uh, measuring drug activity. And uh, in the year 2020, um, we, we've got some you know, pretty sophisticated tools available to us for measuring drug action um, compared to, let's say, uh, 1940, when Goodman and Gilman came out, when um, all they had uh, was uh, the tools like uh, the nictitating membrane uh, or the um, uh, preparation of the uh, ileus uh, of the GI tract to measure gastrointestinal activity and so on. So just a, a little sort of technological note uh, that, that comes up right away to think about how is it that, that, that we know what drugs do. So some of it is overtly observable uh, by, by us, uh, but uh, many of the things that are, that are happening, of course, are, are not uh, sort of uh, macroscopically observable like that, so we re rely upon um, various technology. And you'll be hearing a lot about that from Katie when she talks later in the semester because she is an expert electrophysiologist and she can uh, talk with uh, high confidence uh, about uh, many of the um, really amazing uh, tools that are available um, now to measure uh, electrophysiological effects of, uh, of drug substances and, and naturally occurring uh, neurotransmitters and and, uh, and, and so on. So uh, in humans, um, the, 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 the nictitating membrane is just a vestige, uh, but uh, in uh, animals, it's uh, uh, a much more important part of their anatomy and physiology uh, than, than it is humans uh, right now. And, and, and sometimes you kind of hear uh, the nictitating membrane referred to as like the third membrane or something. It's, it's one of the reasons that um, hip shot can uh, go to sleep like, like he's, he's sawing logs pretty heavily right, right now and, um, and, and have his eyes at least uh, partially open because the nictitating membrane comes across there and provides some protection, but still doesn't uh, you know, completely close the eye off. So it's a very, very interesting thing. Um, so we'll hear more uh, about this as we uh, move into the uh, realm uh, of uh, autonomic pharmacology here in, in a few weeks. So um, technological theme, technological tools available for measuring drug action. And this is just a, a photo of a, a number of our cats. Uh, the, the one uh, sort of in the foreground there, the black and white guy, unfortunately, um, we just lost him to old age here in the last couple of months, but he's been one of our most frequently uh, photographed um, cats. And, you know, there are a number of reasons why I, uh, I do sort of pictures of cats and dogs and things. One is I just like to do it. So it's a selfish sort of thing um, that, that, that I do. But, but also there are, um, you know, lessons of biology and so on um, that uh, the cats can help us out with just like Hip shot, who you sort of see middle middle picture um, there, did with a photo of his uh, nictitating membrane. So um, a lot of different reasons for bringing this forward, and um, but what, one of the main ones I, I hope is is for for us to have a little bit of a good time with it, and and I know that that some people 
um, you know, kind of like this approach of, of photographs of, of animals and some people don't think it's kind of a waste of time. And, and I can uh, understand that. Um, but uh, if, you're, uh, if you're not really interested in this, you're just gonna have to hold on a little bit because I, I'm sort of a fanatic uh, about um, uh, putting these uh, uh, pictures out. And along these lines, I know many of you uh, are uh, aficionados uh, of pets uh, also, or, or um, animals uh, from the wild. And so if you, uh, if you uh, ever wish to, feel free to email uh, pictures to me and I'll uh, consider including those on, on future uh, PowerPoint uh, presentations. One thing that we've done for a number of years, um, we actually didn't do it um, this last spring because um, I kind of uh, ran out of time, uh, but uh, I've taken collections of uh, people's pictures that they send me, including some that, that, that involve uh, human babies, that's fine too. Um, and, and, uh, and I put together a collage of these, of these photographs and then in the last uh, lecture of the spring semester, uh, bring those forward uh, so that everybody can see what everybody else's uh, uh, animal world looks like. And that's, that's been kind of fun to do. Um, we, 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 we've even done some uh, uh, naming of, of pets in that regard. And in fact, the black cat that I mentioned a few years ago, who's in a, in a chair close by here to me now, was. Uh, was named by uh, you pharmacists um, a, a few years back. And um, at least one of her names, um, she has a number of names. One is Olivia, one is Black Cat, of course. And, and one was Moxie, which was the name that the students uh, gave her. And, th and that was uh, after the, uh, the antibiotic moxifloxacin. Um, so I thought that was kind of cute. Uh, and so, uh, you know, hopefully, uh, if we have time, especially uh, spring semester, uh, perhaps we can do a little fun activity like that too. Well, you know, pharmacology and toxicology are about life and death. And, uh, you know, what, what we're uh, uh, trying to do is uh, maximize life and uh, minimize side effects, particularly fatality, fatalities. And so um, I do a lot of showing life on, on these uh, um, pictures, uh, because again, that, that's our, our emphasis is, um, is uh, pr promoting uh, a long life. And uh, as many, perhaps all of you know, um, for those of you that are uh, going to be um, clinical uh, pharmacists, which is uh, most of you, not, not everyone, but uh, most of you, um, you, you not only have uh, human patients, but you have uh, animal patients. Uh, too. And in those cases where the veterinarian um, is not the direct supplier of the, of the drugs, uh, in your, um, if you're in a community um, retail or pharmacy, uh, you'll be um, writing out, or working with some prescriptions for, uh, for pet clients of, of, of your own. And it, it's really interesting to note, and talking a little bit about uh, sources of, of information, I've got a, a wonderful book uh, called uh, something like um, Applied Aspects of Clinical Pharmacology for Veterinarians. And uh, it, it's it, sort of a Goodman and Gilman sized book. So it's, it's up at the, at the university. I don't have it at home here with me. But at, at some point, I'll try to let us take a look at that book. And uh, it, it's by a, a, an author named Claire Booth out of uh, the uh, School of Veterinary Sciences at Auburn University in uh, Alabama. And uh, it's a tremendous resource of information uh, about uh, uh, animal pharmacology and toxicology. And it's uh, when you dwell, dwell into that book a little bit, uh, it, it, it becomes remarkable to find out about the species differences that occur in, in the action of drugs. So, uh, you know, what's going to be Maybe it's not too surprising, but what's going to be happening with a cat versus a dog uh, versus a human um, versus a, a, a gorilla um, 
there, there are very uh, distinct commonalities and there are very distinct differences. And so uh, it's, it's interesting to know something about the pharmacology of, uh, of an, non-human animals as, as well as humans, because of course, um, many of these animals are, are not only uh, our pets, but many of them have been huge participants over the years in terms of our understanding uh, more about drug action. And as I think all of you know, in, in the approval process for prescription drugs, uh, you know, a certain amount of preclinical um, non-human pharmacology is required uh, prior to the, uh, the um, human-based process for, uh, for drug approval. Uh, and so uh, a very, very much, a very big part of our picture, really of pharmacology, is uh, animal pharmacology, uh, non-human -non um, animal pharmacology. So we'll do, do a little bit of that as we go along. And so for example, when we're in a particular classification uh, for a drug, um, we uh, may, may be able to uh, draw upon uh, knowledge from animals to talk about uh, how, how the effects of, of that particular substance in diabetes or, or high blood pressure, whatever it might be, um, plays out. So uh, another theme, um, inter, interspecies uh, differences in uh, drug action. Well, some of the stuff I bring forward is, is just, um, again, for a lot of fun. And uh, of, of course, you're gonna be doing a lot of nervous system pharmacology, particularly with Katie, but uh, myself a little bit too. And I've always really loved this slide about um, elephant brain, which of course is huge. Um, was, yeah, the first line, if you note on whole brain, um, they're, they're in, in sort of uh, uh, average of the elephant brain, you, you're talking about a few kilograms of whole brain. You're, you're talking about 250 plus billion neurons. But notice, and this is, uh, I'm sure something Katie will talk about, there are just about as many or more uh, other types uh, of cells than there are uh, neurons. And, and, and one of the big players in that particular regard are uh, glial cells. And uh, when, when we talk about nervous system pharmacology uh, and, and we talk about it at the cellular level, we'll talk about the effects uh, not only in uh, uh, communicating uh, neurons, uh, but, but also in, in glial cells and, and the, the science of glial science says, I guess, of glial physiology and pharmacology has advanced greatly um, during uh, my decades in the field. And um, when I was uh, first um, lear learning about pharmacology as, as a student, uh, the, the subject of glial cells um, barely came up. Uh, but when I was doing postdoctoral work, I was um, really fortunate uh, to work with some people who uh, you know at the time were kind of uh, pioneers in, uh, in in glial physiology and pharmacology. So I I became aware of uh, that the, the importance of glial cells goes far far beyond just sort of a uh, uh, an architectural sense. For a long time, they were kind of viewed viewed as uh, sort of architectural components that held the system, the nervous system together, which they do. But but now it's recognized that they have you know a, a variety of other uh, supplemental uh, biochemical uh, effects, uh, some of which um, uh, relate to support of neur neuronal function and some of which uh, may be just sort of uh, functionalities on their own regard. But regardless, all these different types of cells are working together as a system to form the, uh, the uh, overt uh, uh, collaborations that occur uh, to, to make life um, what it is. And, and, and to make what life what it is is important, not only to the physiology, but of course, uh, to the uh, impact of that physiology uh, in, in the pharmacological realm. Um, drugs, uh, you know, typically I think the, the broadest way to think about drug action is to think about drugs as reestablishing homeostasis. It's been lost in, in, in the normal physiological system and in which you're trying to renew that that homeostasis 
to promote life a, a little bit longer for the organism that's, that's, being, that's being treated. And some other stuff really comes out of the blue as far as my presentations uh, are, are concerned. Um, but um, um, here's just a few things to, to, to think about, some of which are directly applicable to what, what we're up to uh, now, and some of which are a little bit far afield. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the huge, uh, one of the huge volcanoes in Hawaii, Mauna Loa, uh, is uh, if you measure from its base to its top, not just from sea level, but what's underneath, uh, makes it the Earth's highest mountain. And I think there's, there's a, a bit of a, a scientific lesson there uh, for all of us in that, um, you know, what is most readily uh, observable uh, above the surface uh, is important. It's important in uh, geology, it's important in uh, physiology, uh, but it's also um, important in, um, in, in pharmacology. And, uh, and sometimes we have to look uh, beyond the surface uh, to find out what um, uh, some additionally important uh, uh, consequences of drug action are. So just a, a, a little bit of a, uh, uh, an analogy in, in that uh, particular regard. Um, thinking of uh, organisms which are uh, you know, useful as paradigms or models of uh, physiology, biochemistry, pharmacology, uh, you know, the fruit fly um, doesn't really seem like it would be. It's this tiny little, little thing. I mean, it has this uh, amazing uh, uh, situation in which it, you know, it, it reproduces so rapidly, uh, which is a tremendous um, advantage as far as using it as a, as, as a model system is, is concerned. But beyond that, the, the, the genetics and in, 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 in even uh, the, the anatomy of fruit fly is uh, extremely similar to humans, really. It, it's sort of remarkable. And although the fruit fly brain contains a small number of cells in, in the range of 100,000 uh, relative to elephant brain or, or human brain, um, nevertheless, the characteristics of, of those cells uh, make it a, a, a very meaningful uh, model. Um, and, uh, and that uh, um, is, is something that we, we need to um, remember once in a while as we're looking at models which uh, at, at the surface value you would think um, wouldn't be all that useful to us but they can be but then again we still have to always keep in, in mind the differences too and so we can't totally um, re rely upon models that's why in, in drug approval of course you ultimately have to get to the huge clinical studies which are now occurring with respect to the uh, to the virus and these um, you know major human clinical studies which enroll uh, many, many thousands of, of, of patients uh, are, uh, are, are critical in terms of our uh, examination of the effectiveness and the uh, uh, adversity of uh, various drug substances, um, whether we're talking about small molecules like epinephrine or very large uh, things like, uh, like vaccines. Um, the next point there is one that we were talking about with respect to that elephant brain situation a little bit, is the, uh, the importance of uh, various uh, multiple types of, uh, of cells in terms of uh, the, uh, what's going on in, uh, in, in, in brain, uh, again, be it animal, non-human animal or human brain. Um, some of the later points on, on this slide uh, just refer us in, in terms of relevance to some of the major areas that we'll be talking about um, later on in, in the course. And if you look uh, at the latter part of this first semester again and, and, and view those uh, uh, nervous system related topics uh, that are so crucial to us at that point, we'll, we'll see some of the um, uh, areas that are uh, listed here in this slide. So for example, in schizophrenia, uh, which uh, is one of the major uh, psychopathologies uh, that, that we'll be uh, taking a look at. Um, somewhere in the range of uh, two, 2 million plus uh, individuals in the United States alone um, uh, suffer from, from schizophrenia. When you have um, suffering of that magnitude, 
then of course that that leads to uh, potential interest in uh, drug remedies as being at least part of, of the um, uh, therapeutic address to that particular situation. Um, major antipsychotic drugs basically came into use uh, in, um, from a scientific standpoint in, in the 1950s. Um, and and when, when we talk about antipsychotic drugs later in, in the course, we'll trace that um, uh, evolution of uh, uh, antipsychotic drugs up to the year 2020 to, to some degree. Uh, of course, there were, there were culturally, culturally based uh, approaches that were used for treating uh, psychoses uh, before the scientific era. Um, but from uh, a, the scientific standpoint, the uh, availability of, of um, uh, anti-schizophrenic drugs is, is a relatively um, new endeavor. And it's uh, uh, as, as limited as antipsychotic drugs are in their current actions, they are not curative, they are palliative. But um, despite that fact, the availability of antipsychotic drugs is still uh, an Im extraordinarily important and positive thing although imperfect thing right now. When we think about the era, era which would be you know, pr pretty much before 1950, uh, and, and that there really weren't uh, any commonly recognized, scientifically based antipsychotic drugs uh, available is a, a, a scary thought um, to, to be sure. And I'll never forget uh, from an anecdotal standpoint uh, when, when I was, uh, uh, not in graduate school, but before that in undergrad school, uh, and um, taking a, a psychology course um, in abnormal psychology, we went to visit uh, a ward in a, um, a psych psychiatric hospital, and um, the, uh, the the memories of that visit still resonate uh, very highly um, to me uh, to this uh, particular day. And uh, the, the the availability of, of antipsychotic drugs was only in its infancy um, at that particular time. Um, anxiety disorders are uh, huge in the human population, uh, U.S. or, or otherwise, um, in in the range of uh, uh, 25 million. And I'd say that might be an underestimate. Plus. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. are affected by anxiety orders, disorders. And, uh, and therefore, of course, anti-anxiety drugs are, are one of our you know, major drug categories and have been for many decades. And there's, there's a, you know, dramatic development uh, still occurring uh, in, in the realm of anti-anxiety drugs as there are in the realm of antipsychotic drugs like schizophrenia. Both those areas are, are ones of major magnitude um, in, uh, in current uh, developmental uh, processes for, for new, new drugs. Um, and then the, the last uh, bullet point there, 15 million uh, plus in the United States um, suffer from very severe uh, migraine headache. And, and migraine was one of the areas for many, many years um, in, in which um, we, we were sort of lagging behind in terms of the thera ther therapeutic aspects of migraine with, with respect to drug substances. We are very, very fortunate, though, in, in that particular realm. And, and about, oh, one and a half to two decades ago, um, the big breakthroughs occurred in, in the development of acutely active um, uh, migraine drugs. So that was a real uh, pro move forward. But um, in treating chronic migraine prophylactically um, lagged even further behind. But again, uh, some good news there, and we'll talk about this um, in specifics here in another month or two. Um, some uh, very, very effective and, and not so adverse, um, chronically uh, important um, prophylactic anti-migraine drugs have come out just in the last few years, and others are almost ready to come out uh, again. Uh, so uh, it, it's great to have a, a drug category in which you can look at and say, well, there's really been some really neat progress which has occurred uh, lately. And, uh, and, and that is certainly the case in the migraine realm. 
this uh, tongue in cheek slide here, as you can tell, I just did a hand drawing of, of, of the slide. Uh, but, um, you know, it might seem at first glance that um, what we consider to be a drug substance is a sort of a trivial matter. And, and, and perhaps it is if you consider just about anything, any chemical substance that, that results in changes in uh, um, uh, activity as, as a drug substance. But um, not, not everybody um, defines drugs so broad, broadly as that. For our purposes here in this course, and it's just my own emphasis, in, and, and you can have your own um, uh, definition of what you want to consider to be a drug substance. Um, but in this course, we're going to consider a very bright, broad swath of, of chemical substances as, uh, as being uh, drug substances. And I, I listed um, one, one of the more uh, interesting uh, tongue-in-cheek approaches uh, to defining what a drug substance is, um, which uh, was originally defined by a, a historically important pharmacologist. His name was Chauncey Lee and quoted by Edgar King Davis in a, a, a historical review of pharmacology from a few years back, uh, in which they defined a drug as a substance that when injected into a rat produces a scientific paper. And, and, and I, I thought, well, okay, that, 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 that's, um, that's a real um, interesting approach in that uh, regard. I, I hand drew the, the structure to um, reserpine re um, below. Uh, just to um, uh, suggest when you see a structure like that, you probably don't have any trouble uh, re referring to that substance as, as being a drug substance. That may be just uh, a matter of fact thing for, for us. But also put reserpine on there for a, uh, a historical reason that, that dates back to um, where, where I'm, uh, right here, uh, uh, anti-schizophrenic drugs. In, in the scientific realm, uh, reserpine was uh, the very first uh, drug w which specifically, uh, in terms of uh, Western uh, scientific thought, was, was introduced as an antipsychotic. You may not hear much about it in that regard um, in, anymore because so many other drugs uh, fairly rapidly um, bypassed reserpine uh, be, because of their effectiveness and, and lower um, adversity. Uh, but from a purely historical standpoint, uh, reserpine stands out in that regard. Uh, it, it's now, although still used, uh, especially elsewhere in, in the world, but to some minor degree in, in the United States um, as a, um, a therapeutic drug, uh, it's still um, most, mostly important now as a, a scientific tool. Uh, drug, drug, drugs, many different drugs, of course, are superb scientific tools. and. Um, Reserpine depletes synapses of monoamines such as serotonin and uh, norepinephrine, and therefore is a, a, a very uh, important uh, tool. So we may hear more about it later on, more in, in, in the realm of scientific investigation uh, than in the realm of, of, of therapeutics. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll probably talk about it most um, in, in both those regards. Um, so what is a drug? Well, really, that's a cute definition, but it goes much beyond um, a, a substance uh, that, uh, when injected into a rat, produces um, a scientific you know, paper. Um, one, one thing to think about in terms of um, definitions of, of drug substances is the, the relationship between nutritional science and pharmacological science. And uh, having just... Uh, uh, had uh, pro pro probably most of us having just had lunch in the last uh, hour or two um, may have had a thinking about nutritional things but many many substances are clearly not nutritional things some very clearly are nutritional things and some substances sort of exist on on, on a on a borderline in that particular uh, aspect and, and it's possible for example uh, that uh, a substance like um, caffeine is one that, that uh, straddles that, that borderline. As uh, pharmaceutical scientists, most of us probably uh, don't have any trouble in defining caffeine as a drug substance. We probably do that um, pr pretty naturally. Uh, but but to, to other people, 
Um, caffeine may be considered to be more of something that lands uh, in the nutritional realm. And the re reality may be somewhere in, in between there in that uh, many, many substances are nutritionally active and are also active as drug substances. So another theme that we'll sort of approach as we go throughout the year is that relationship that exists uh, between uh, pharmacology and, and nutrition science. Well, I've just included a few uh, tissues and, and, and organs of great importance to us in terms of our uh, understanding of the whole holistic or understanding that we have of, uh, of pharmacology. And uh, undoubtedly, uh, last year in, in, uh, in physiology, um, you uh, had uh, quite a bit of uh, emphasis upon uh, the endocrine pan pancreas uh, with res respect to, uh, to uh, drug action. But you, you probably also in, uh, in a, a, a physiological context studied the exocrine pancreas um, also. And so, uh, you know, one, one of the more important um, organs for sure um, is the pancreas. And w with the, uh, uh, the order that we do things um, in, anymore, there's a bit of a, a gap in that you um, study the endocrine pancreas in physiology uh, first semester and it'll be late second semester before we study much about it here in, in, the, um, in, in the pharmacology uh, course, but it'll certainly uh, be a, 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 a very important topic for us in that particular regard when we get to it. But, you know, we, we, we will see it to some degree um, before then because um, when, when we talk about uh, the pharmacology of, uh, uh, of endocrine, uh, drug substances, uh, the autonomic nervous system, uh, you know, has some uh, regulation in that particular regard. And autonomics is the very first nervous system topic that we encounter. So sometimes we encounter various things at various parts in, in our uh, in our uh, uh, study um, because there are different ways to to classify things. And along those lines, I want to skip forward here. We'll come back to these things. I'm going to skip forward for just a minute um, and um, talk about this for, for a second, uh, but we'll, we'll talk about it more um, tomorrow. But I want us to start thinking about this uh, before we uh, exit for the day. Um, this, uh, this slide, or a very similar one, was the very last slide um, th that we, we had uh, in the uh, 444. Uh, pharmacology course last spring and in in many springs um, before that and, uh, and 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 some of this relates to what we were just talking about and that that is in terms of classification as a useful but limited tool as far as pharmacology is concerned one thing that you'll hear us doing a lot of when we go throughout the the, the year is uh, slotting drugs into identifiable uh, classifications so insulin, for example, is not only a physiological substance, but uh, is a um, pharmacological substance uh, that we classify in the realm of uh, hormonally active uh, drug substances. So th such classification um, is um, important uh, because if we just move one bullet point up, the dose makes the response is the, the single greatest uh, characteristic of drug substances, which is common across drug groups um, and is common at least so far in, in the ages that we've been discovering pharmacology, and I'm confident will we'll continue. Um, but, but really what it is, there are many dose response relationships for drugs, not just a single dose response relationship. And those many different um, uh, uh, dose related classifications leads to, uh, to uh, overall classification for that drug substance. So um, as we s categorize a certain type of uh, action, dose responsive action of insulin, for example, that causes us to uh, classify insulin as a hormonal drug. Um, but um, uh, insulin is also a, a growth factor, uh, which you could consider to be a hormonal thing um, also, but which might make us think of a slightly different classification um, for, for uh, insulin. Um, so as we look at these various dose-response relationships, we'll come up with different um, classifications. 
and we'll find those very useful because when we think about a hormonal action, it may help us think about certain um, types of, uh, of, of things. But we don't want to get too locked into that because, um, again, uh, there, there are uh, multiple classifications as well as multiple dose responses. And so we need to take another look. And uh, uh, one of the things that I'll be cautioning ourselves about as we go along is that as, as much as uh, we, we get into the whole uh, business of the importance of drug classification, and, and I often ask students to say, the very first thing I want you to do when, when you think about a drug substance is to think about the most common classification or the most common cl classifications in, in, the, in the plural. But no sooner do you do that than you take a step back, take another look and say, well, maybe there are some other classifications that are useful here. Um, some of which we may not even know about, but which will uh, um, uh, occur um, in our, our lifetimes as pharmaceutical scientists because of the evolution of pharmacological and toxicological science as we have new tools, recognize new effects, and therefore lead to new dose response curves, dose response curves and new classifications for drugs. So think about those things a little bit. Um, see if it spurs some thought on, on your parts um, as, as we meet again, uh, which we will do tomorrow for our third meeting at one o'clock um, on uh, Thursday afternoon. In the old days of meeting in a, in, in a room, we often actually switched to classroom as we went from Wednesday to, to Thursday, but no, no, no difference in classroom this time. It'll be the Zoom classroom uh, once again. And uh, I'll let all of you go because I know you have uh, many other things to do. We'll start with questions uh, as, as we begin um, on, on Thursday and look at some of these other themes of pharmacology and toxicology. Thanks a lot and take care, everybody. See you tomorrow. Have a good day. Thanks. Thanks. You too, everybody. Be safe. <clears throat>